Well, good morning. Happy Tuesday. It is a beautiful day outside. It is March 20... May. <laughs> We're in the month of May. May 21st, 2024. Thanks for joining me. Um, we are uh, we are here to, to study God's Word and... Um, <laughs> Um, I was, I was thinking about, uh, oh my goodness. I hold on just a second. I, I knew I was missing something. Let me do this real quick. Let's do this. There we go. Um, just, uh, how beautiful it's been outside. We have not hit yet a hundred degrees and for us to not hit a hundred degrees by May 21st is cr- truly exceptional. We were sitting outside last night and just enjoying the evening and it's uh, it's just this is amazing. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing to be able to to enjoy such a beautiful evening. We are um, we were uh, what was it? It was ninety one, and I asked uh, Alexa what the temperature was in Chicago, and it was like eighty six. So we're we are kind of you know almost you know. I mean, it's just beautiful. That's all I can say. <laughs> I'm really, really enjoying the weather, as you can probably tell. It's just beautiful. Um, and hey, thanks for joining me, and I hope you're having a great day. Uh, we we don't have any birthdays today, so we have one tomorrow. So I'm going to close that window out. And oh, where's everything? Yeah. And um, let's see here. Yeah, we'll have one tomorrow, and that'll be it. And then. What uh, as far as the schedule goes, we're gonna we're gonna meet today, and then Wednesday and Thursday, and then we'll be off for a couple weeks because I got a bunch of different things coming up, and um, uh, we'll we'll get back together after that. G- gonna go uh, go go see. Uh, I'm I'm gonna help my son <laughs> move to Janesville, Minnesota. Oh my goodness! If you can imagine a small town, twenty. 500 people. So it's not very big. And it has the high school because the two neighboring towns, one has 500 people and one has 300 people, but they all, they all combined one high school and it's in the town of Janesville. So the high school's there. And also the, um, uh, how, how do you say this? The, the closest town, the closest biggest town is called Mankato. Minnesota, which isn't that big. I mean, it's it's probably, I think I saw it was almost at 50,000 people, maybe 46,000 people or something like that. And at 50,000 people, you really start to become something. <laughs> it's hard for me. I've always lived in a large town, you know, Phoenix and, and Denver. And um, I mean, I've just I've never lived in a small town. I guess the smallest town I lived in was when I lived in Seward, Nebraska to go to college for a bit, um, population of a thousand people, but these small towns that grew up out in the middle of nowhere, they typically have a bank and they'll have a couple, you know, grocery stores. And this one has a dairy queen. So all is good. (laughs) You can't have a town without a dairy queen. Um, anyway, so I'm really excited to experience this town and, I bet you I can walk from one end of the town to the other in an hour, <laughs> easily, probably, and that'll be exciting. Um, all right, so we only have a few days before that happens, and we are going to transition. Let's go ahead and get into our study. We're going to transition from uh, First and Second Samuel into First and Second Kings, and the story continues. And the the dividing point between First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings is the end of the reign of King David. And th- what happens after the reign of King David is we get a bunch of other kings, and we go through this period of time. Obviously, the first king, David's successor, Solomon. We'll, we'll take up a good chunk of the story, and then we'll have other kings, and they'll have other problems. And and it's kind of a it's a, it's a a kind of a love story, I guess, or it's a it's a I don't know if it's a Greek tragedy. Um, but basically, you're going to have this high point, which is 
Israel united, King David is still the king, and then we're going to have ebbs and flows of the kingdom until we get to the point where the nation of Israel is no longer, and they've been deported, and uh, it's pretty much the end. And in, in, in Jewish history, King David really is the high point of the whole story. Obviously, you've got Moses rescuing the people out of slavery in Egypt. That's a high point of the story. But then they wander in the wilderness, they go through a bunch of judges, and then they finally get their king. And King David is, is um, you know, you look back at King David's reign as the Israelites, and they say, this was the pinnacle of who we were as a nation. Uh, David was was king over both kingdoms. It was United Kingdom, although we can see there was really some seeds of uh, problems even during David's reign. But it it um, it's it's a bit of a sad story to tell you the truth. To to go from this, and it's not like King David's reign was all that great as far as him doing all the right things. He made mistakes. the The whole nation of Israel. Um, made mistakes, but David was faithful to God, and David learned from his mistakes, and he moved on, and he uh, he, he reigned Israel for a good good amount of time, and um, it, it, it everybody wants to go back and look and say this was the glory days of Israel, but but there were good times after this too. The nation of Israel is not dead; they just go through a lot of problems. And um, we'll find that as we go through First and Second Kings. But, but the ultimate trajectory of the story is a bit of sadness because they, have been, they are loved by God, they're brought into the promised land, and all they have to do is remain faithful to God. And they don't. They, um, they kind of mess it all up. <laughs> and, um, and it doesn't go well for them in the end. But, but that's okay, because the Messiah does come, and he sits on David's throne, and uh, he rules with justice and equity and saves his people. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior. He's the Anointed One. And um, all of these stories leading up to Jesus are leading up to Jesus. Jesus is the central point of all of history, and um, this is just one of the timelines getting into that it all lays the groundwork for Jesus to come, for God to become flesh and dwell among us. All right, uh, so let's let's start reading. Oh, well, the other thing is is that this covers a period of about four hundred years. It's a long period of time, and as far as like who wrote this, it doesn't really say. Tradition has it that it was Jeremiah, that. Um, he kind of collected all these stories and put it together in a book. But it's all conjecture because nobody really knows. It doesn't say in the book who wrote it. Um, but it definitely tells the story, and it tells the complete story from First Kings to the end of the Second Kings. So let's let's get into this, and um, we're still David's still alive. So let's uh, let's see what what's happening. This is First Kings chapter one. When King David was very old, he could not keep warm, even when they put covers over him. So his attendants said to him, Let us look for a young virgin to serve the king and take care of him. She can lie beside him so that our lord the king may keep warm. Then they searched throughout Israel for a beautiful young woman and found Abishag, a Shunammite, and brought her to the king. The woman was very beautiful. She took care of the king and waited on him, but the king had no sexual relations with her. So this is um, th- this is how they solve this problem. And if you've ever been on a cold evening, th- there's a there was a band in the '70s called a Three Dog Night, and uh, it comes from the old legend that when it gets really, 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 really cold, you bring three dogs into bed with you, <laughs> and they um, they keep you warm. And the colder the night, the the more dogs you bring in. And uh, one of their one of the songs was. One is the loneliest number that you ever knew. Um, that was Three Dog Night. And um, I remember I remember that song so vividly because it came out the summer I was um, spending uh, 
the the weeks with my grandparents at their they had a a, a trailer on the river in Cottonwood, Arizona. And uh, they end, it ended up flooding it out all the time, so they got rid of it. But I remember going and catching frogs and fireflies and fish. <laughs> it was wonderful. Just those innocent little times. And that was one of the songs that was playing back then. Um, so this is a common thing to do, is to bring another warm body into bed with you. And of course, they can't bring just any old one. They can't bring a dog. They can't bring three dogs into the king. If you're a dog sledder, sure, bring in a couple dogs. But when you're the king, you have to have a beautiful woman. So they search throughout Israel to find a beautiful woman. And uh, they find this young woman named Abishag. And uh, she's a Shunammite, and they bring her into King David. But apparently he doesn't have relations with her. Although um, we'll find out later that it's likely that he made her a concubine. He just never uh, did anything with that. Um, and she's very, very beautiful. She's with King David. And th- this is an accepted practice at this time. We may look at it now and say, that's crazy that you would do that. But back then, it was an accepted practice. And uh, she seems to be fine with it. David seems to be fine with it. I mean, the purpose is for medical emergency, right? Um, you know, uh, we today we would have electric blankets, and those are also nice. But, um, you know, I'm sure David's not going to be upset <laughs> by having a human electric blanket in bed with him to keep him warm. Um, David's like, oh, I'm so cold. <laughs> Go find me a, a virgin. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And, of course, she's beautiful. And uh, so she comes into bed to keep David warm. And uh, so David's kind of... I've, I've, apparently, David's about 70 years old. And um, we think today 70 is not all that old. I, I know a lot of 70-year-olds that are running marathons. So, um, But David lived a much, much harder life than we do. Um, he is definitely wearing out quite a bit. And he's getting old. There, you know, there's no medical, <clears throat> you know, there's no m- drugs that he can take to reduce the pain or anything like that. It's it's basically he, he's getting older and more frail and cold. And so they're helping him out. All right. Verse five. Now Adonijah, whose mother was Haggith, put himself forward and said, I will be king. So he got chariots and horses, ready with 50 men to run ahead of him. His father had never rebuked him by asking, Why do you behave as you do? He was also very handsome and was born next after Absalom. So add, so um, this young man named Adonijah, and he was apparently born next after Absalom. Different mothers, but born after Absalom. We know that what happened to Absalom. And so this next person is Adonijah. I wonder if I have a chart. I think I do have a chart. Hold on. Let me just see. Um, okay, so where where are we? Okay, we remember Absalom and Tamar and, and Tamar from Makkah. And then Adonijah is here from Haggith. So, um, so he is also a son of King David, but from a different mother, Haggith where uh, Absalom is from Makkah. So apparently in the palace where you have all these wives, they um, have all these sons. And because they're from different mothers, you could have a son born on the same day. You could have like two boys born on the same day. Uh, They didn't, but they had Absalom. And then right after Absalom, they um, they have Adonijah. And now he wants to be king. Uh... So um, he puts himself forward and he says, I want to be king. So he goes and gets chariots and horses and he gets men. I mean, all the things that you would need if you're going to be king, he starts to assemble. And apparently his father never rebuked him by saying, why do you behave as you do? And apparently was also very handsome, which is not surprising at all. King David seems to surround himself with beautiful women. He just can't help himself. 
and King David himself is very handsome. So all of these children are are beautiful children it, because that type of thing you know runs in genes most most of the time, not always. Um, the father doesn't rebuke him, but he, uh, he wants to be king, so he starts to <laughs> assemble. And remember, who who is the? I mean, we have uh, King Saul who was anointed king by Samuel, and then you have David, also anointed by Samuel. But now David's, you know, getting older, and and uh, S- Samuel's no longer there to anoint who the next king is. So how do you transition the leadership of a king? And obviously lineage, it being in the line of the king, makes a lot of sense because you grow up in the palace, you see how the kingdom works. Uh, so you have a little bit of advantage. There's no law that says that it has to be lineage. As a matter of fact, you might want somebody to be king who's not in the lineage. Shake things up a little bit, but um, we, we'll keep it in the family. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it, we'll see if that's good or bad. So Adonijah wants to be king. So he assembles all this stuff. And then what does he do? Verse 7, Adonijah then conferred with Joab, son of Zariah, and with Abiathar, the priest, and they gave him their support. But Zadok, the priest, ben- Beniah, son of Jehoiada, Nathan, the prophet, Shimei, and Ray, and David's special guard did not join Adonijah. So um, Joab seems to think that he's okay. Remember, Joab is the commander of the king's armor. He is the really the one, seems to be later in life, having a bit of pulling the strings. And he is... Um, okay with Adonijah being king, so he lends his support. Also, Abiathar lends his support. But Zadok, remember Zadok was the guy that remained in Jerusalem, um, very, very loyal to to King David. Uh, Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, Nathan, we've heard of Nathan the prophet, right? A very, very close confidant of David, rebuked David with Bathsheba's um, indiscretion, uh, all these other people, and th- th- these are these are definite. So you've got the military side, which is Joab. They want Adonijah, but the other people, the religious people, they are not necessarily on board. And why wouldn't they be on board? Because the military people want military men, right? They want military might and strength. Adonijah, you know, he's got the initiative. He's gonna got the drive. He's got all these horses and chariots. But these other people want somebody else. They want somebody who's going to be connected to God. They, what makes a great leader? Is it somebody who has a lot of strength, a lot of power, somebody who's fearless, somebody who's willing to do the hard things like kill other people? I mean, obviously, if you're a military commander, that's the type of leader you want. On the other side, you want somebody who's a little bit more nuanced, somebody who seeks God's will, somebody who prays to God constantly, the, the, and so it's it's not surprising that Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet, all of these people are looking for somebody a little bit more, less military and more God, I guess you could say. So they're not on board yet. So what happens? Verse 9, Adonijah then sacrificed sheep, cattle, and fattened calves at the stone of Zeholoth near En-Rogel. He invited all his brothers, the king's sons, and all the royal officials of Judah but he did not invite Nathan, the prophet, or Benaiah, or the special guard, or his brother Solomon. Hmm. So none of the other brothers seem to want to be king. They're perfectly fine tending their own flocks and sheep and families. Adonijah invites all his brothers to come and be a part of this sacrifice, and it must be a huge sacrifice. Sheep, cattle, calves, and they go to the stone of Zeholoth, and they offer this sacrifice. Solomon's not there, and Nathan the prophet's not there, nor Benaiah. And uh, he offers the sacrifice. Verse 11, Then Nathan asked Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, Have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king of our Lord David knows nothing about it? And our Lord David knows nothing about it. Now then, let me advise you how you can save your own life and the life of your son Solomon. Go into the King David, go into King David and say to him, My lord the king, did you not swear to me your servant? 
Surely Solomon, your son, shall be king after me, and he will sit on my throne. Why then has Adonijah become king? While you are still there talking to the king, I will come in, and I will add my word to what you have said. So this promise of David to Bathsheba that Solomon will be king uh, needs to be upheld. And Nathan remembers this, and he has had his eye on Solomon. And so when he finds out that Adonijah is kind of anointing himself king, he goes to Bathsheba and says, wait, we can't have this. Your life is at risk, and Solomon's life is at risk. Maybe even my life is at risk. And we have to subvert this. And the way to do that is for you to go into King David, remind him of this promise, and then I will come in, kind of just happen to be in, and he, because I will be there, he'll ask for my advice, I will corroborate the promise, and he'll remember that, and then we'll put Solomon on the throne. So it's a little bit of a ruse. People have, we saw a ruse is similar to this before. It's not necessarily a ruse. It's just a staged event to help remind King David of the promise. So what happens? Verse 15, so Bathsheba went to see the aged king in his room where Abishag, the Shumanite, was attending him. And Bathsheba bowed down, prostrating herself before the king. What is it you want? The king asked. And she said to him, my Lord, you yourself swore to me, your servant, by the Lord your God, um, by the Lord your God, not the Lord our God, the Lord your God. Interesting. Um, in, in Jewish tradition, uh, the man is the head of the family, and whatever the man of the family uh, believes, teaches, confesses, that's what the whole family believes, teaches, and confesses. And so... It truly is David's God. Now, his whole family follows David's God, but it truly is this relationship between David and God. Um, Solomon, your son, shall be king after me, and he will sit on my throne. But now Adonijah has become king, and you, my lord, the king, do not know about it. He has sacrificed great numbers of cattle, fattened calves, and sheep, and has invited all the king's sons, Abiathar, the priest, and Joab, the commander of the army. But he has not invited Solomon, your servant. My lord, the king, the eyes of all of Israel are on you to learn from you who will sit on the throne of my lord, the king, after him. Otherwise, as soon as my lord, the king, is laid to rest with his ancestors, and I and my son Solomon will be treated as criminals. So she's laying it out. She's like, you promised him, Solomon, that he would be king. And if you don't do this, because everyone's looking at you, now is the time. And if you don't do this, Adonijah is going to be king. We're going to be slain. And sure enough, what happens? Uh, while she was speaking with the king, Nathan the prophet arrived, and the king was told, Nathan the prophet is here. So he went before the king and bowed with his face to the ground. Nathan said, Have you, my lord, the king, declared that Adonijah shall be king after you and that he will sit on your throne? Today he's gone down and sacrificed great numbers of cattle, fatted calves and sheep. He has invited all the king's son, the commanders of the army, Abiathar the priest, right now they're eating and drinking with him and saying, Long live the king Adonijah. But me, your servant, and Zadok the priest, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and your servant Solomon, he did not invite. Is this something my lord the king has done without letting his servant know who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him? So they're saying, listen, you've already said Solomon's going to be king. And now they're out celebrating. Did you go back on your word? Is... is um. Is this how it's going to be for? Is Solomon not going to be king? Uh, is it going to be Adonijah? And um, so that's where we'll sit at, for there. Because David will have to make a decision. Will he remember his promise to Solomon, to Bathsheba? Uh, or will he uh, go the easy route, which is just to basically say, well, Adonijah has already made himself king, so let's just let him go forward. Which doesn't sound like something David would do. Um. You know, transition from leadership is really, really hard. Uh, it is in countries. And, um, the, you know, long leadership is good, but then they gain so much power, you can't, they can't get out of power. And so the Constitution here in the United States basically limits the power of the three branches of government, puts it all, puts power in three different areas so they can fight it out. And uh, I think that's a good thing. It slows things down, but it doesn't concentrate power too much. 
Um, but in the time of David, all the power is concentrated in David right now. And now where's that power going to go? Adonijah or Solomon? Well, we know it's going to go to Solomon, but we'll have to wait until next time. Uh, let's close in prayer. Gracious God, thanks for this day. Uh, until we meet again, keep us in your grace. Amen. Uh, let's go over here and see all of you joining me online. Oh, yay, Neva. I'm so happy you're able to join us. Um, uh, I, you know, a small town where you know everyone and everyone cares for you. Is that, um, is, it, I, I've never lived in a small town, but one of the things I've heard is that, you know, everybody knows everybody's business, which is good because, you know, they can, you know, bring potlucks if somebody's sick or something like that. But the other thing is that everybody knows everybody's business. <laughs> so I will be so anxious because John has never lived in a small town. I'll be so anxious to see how this all works out. I think the hardest part in a small town is keeping employed because um, you have to understand the economics of money. But what happens in small towns is that these large corporations come in and they'll build a grocery store and then all the profits from that grocery store go to the corporation. So eventually the amount of money circulating in that economy just is depleted and the whole town falls apart. So um, it's, uh, it's just, it's having a job is the best thing. If you don't have a job, it can be really, really challenging. Um, <laughs> So I, this is new to me. I have no, I mean, I've never, I did live in a small town for a period of time, but we were, you know, tied with the college. So I'll be very, very curious to see how this all goes and for how long it goes too. All right. So um, what else? I guess that's it. Um, thank you for joining me. Uh, let me go over to here and um, I pray God's blessings on your day and we'll see you tomorrow. Take care. Bye.